Hi everyone, today we're going to be going over tidal depositional systems. First, just a disclaimer, tide dominated systems are affected by both wave and fluvial processes. And so as we're talking about the tidal caused sedimentary structures and stratigraphy that can occur in tide dominated areas, remember that most examples used in this presentation are assuming minimal fluvial and wave influence. And so know that all of these tidal exclusive features are very rare in ancient stratigraphy, but when you do see them, they're very helpful for determining depositional environment. So let's get into the lecture. First things first, I want to distinguish tides and waves. I know this seems kind of simple, but it is worth stating before we start, just so we're all on the same page. Tides are the periodic rise and fall of large masses of water, and tides are due to the moon's gravitational pull on Earth, which I'll talk about in the next couple slides. And waves, on the other hand, are caused by wind. And so Waves can occur on any body of water, but tides only occur in the oceans because the ocean is a big enough body of water to be affected by the moon's gravity. And because tides are the rise and fall of water bodies, important for geology is to note that tide current directions are always perpendicular to the shoreline, whereas waves can be oblique to the shoreline and causing things like longshore drift, which I talked about in the shore face environment video. And so the features and structures cause by tides and waves are different. Here in the picture to the right, we can see an example of the tide coming into this beach, and we see where the people are walking is about to be covered in water when the tide comes in, and you can see how much of an influence the tide will have compared to the waves, which are just the features pointed out by the arrows, which are at the surface water caused by wind rather than the entire water body's movement. So now we'll get into a little bit about the origin of tides. What are tides? Where do they come from and why? Well, here in this animation, we can see that there is the sun, the earth, and the moon. And the moon is currently rotating around earth. And what this causes is that the moon's gravitational pull will pull on the oceans on earth, causing what's called a tidal bulge. This bulge caused by the moon's gravitational pull is shown here in pink, and the bulge that's caused by the sun's gravitational pull on Earth is here in yellow. Because the moon is much closer to Earth, the moon's gravitational effect on Earth and the bulge that it causes on Earth is larger than the sun's effect. Another thing we notice in this figure is the words at the top that keep popping up called neap and spring tides. Spring tides are when the earth and the moon and the sun are all lined up and therefore this gravitational pull from the moon and the sun on earth are all in a line and therefore the bulge effect on the tides on earth is larger and exacerbated and this is when the tides are the highest. And the neap tide is when the moon and the sun line up with Earth at a perpendicular angle and their effects cancel out each other and the bulge is smaller and therefore tides are not as high. Here at the bottom we have the spring tides when the moon is on either side of Earth lining up with the sun and neap tides when the moon is perpendicular. Additionally, spring and neap tides occur twice a month because the moon rotates around Earth fully in about a month. And so two times a month, spring and neap tides will occur. This explains the difference in tidal range a couple times a month, but it doesn't explain why we have high and low tide every day. So while we're looking at these figures with the sun's effect on Earth, the moon's effect on Earth, what about Earth's effect on Earth? Earth is not staying still. It is rotating on its axis. And because of this rotation, Earth rotates under the tidal bulge. And so the tidal bulge will be in a different location on Earth depending depending on Earth's rotation at the moment. And so we have to remember that the moon's rotation around Earth causes spring and neap tides twice a month, and that Earth's rotation causes the high and low tides that we see every single day. Now getting into tidal range. Tidal range is the range in which the water level changes from low tide to high tide. So in the image to the right, the moving animation, we can see that the high tide versus low tide length in between is labeled as tidal range. That 
that's what the tidal range is. And as the current comes in to land in the high tide, that's called the flood current. And as it goes back out during low tide, that's called the ebb current, as you can see in the figure. Additionally, tidal range is defined, depending on its height, as microtidal, when the tidal range is less than a meter, mesotidal, when the tidal range is about a meter to 3.5 meters, and macrotidal, when the tidal range is at its largest. And this is when the tidal range is about 3.5 to over 5 meters. This is a huge tidal range. And so the areas where the deposition is going to be mostly dominated by tidal deposits is where you have macrotidal effects. These locations include the circled areas on this map. We can see that the dark blue upper macro tidal, meaning over five meters of tidal range, is pointing out the locations of the shorelines where the tidal influence is extremely dominant. And so these are the areas where we would expect to see distinguishable features that are indicative of tidal processes. So let's get into some of the structures that we'll see due to tides. For example, cyclic tidal rhythmites can be easily predicted assuming ideal conditions. What I mean by this is in an ideal case, there should technically be 28 sand and mud laminae in a neap spring cycle. What do I mean by neap spring cycle? Well, we already discussed how every month or about 28 days, there are two spring and neap tides. So if we look at the figure to the left, we can see these rhythmic deposits of laminae showing spring tide in the lighter laminae and neap tide in the darker laminae and then spring tide again and the neap tide spring tide neap tide etc theoretically if we know that high and low tide occurs every single day and that spring and neap tides occur twice a month and if we know that with every high and low tide there is one laminate deposit caused by the flood current then we should theoretically be able to calculate how many layers or laminae there should be after a 28 day cycle of spring and neap tides, which should technically be 28 since these would occur once a day. However, this is rarely observed, and reasons for this include that it may become more than 28 laminae if the ebb tide is strong enough to deposit a sand layer. Additionally, it can become less than 28 if the neap tide is too weak to produce recognizable laminae, or if the spring tide is so strong that it erodes previous deposits, and we call these tidal rhythmites that don't have the expected number of laminae non cyclic rhythmites. Another thing that could affect the deposition of these rhythmites and disturb the perfection of the number of laminae is waves. Wave processes and obviously fluvial processes, if dominant enough in the area, can do a lot of erosion of tidal deposits. And so it's important to remember that this has to be a really tidal dominant area for tidal deposits to be preserved. So now we'll talk about how the flood and ebb tide typically deposit sand and mud. So in these figures, we can see this vertical squiggly line, but what does it mean? Well, this line is indicating the flood and the ebb tide. For example, in figure A, we have a symmetrical tide, which means that the flood and the ebb tide intensity and velocity is equal to each other. So the flood and the ebb tide do the same amount of erosion and deposition, and this causes the formation of two sand layers, and in between those two sand layers, there's a mud layer. The mud layer occurs because during the phase between flood and ebb current, you're going to have a period in which the water is not moving either direction, and in this period it's called the slack water period. During this period, suspended mud settles down and deposits this mud layer called a mud drape. And the sand deposits in these figures, which are the tan rectangles in these strat columns, are what happens during the flood and ebb tide. However, the ebb tide is typically much less strong and therefore has less velocity and less erosional and deposition ability than the flood tide. And so as we can see in figures B and C, these are more common situations to be in. What we see in these figures is that the ebb tide is not strong enough to deposit a lot of sand or 
in the case of figure B, there's absolutely no ebb deposit because the ebb current is just not strong enough to pick up or deposit anything. And so as we talked about in the fluvial video, you need to have enough velocity to erode and deposit certain grain sizes of sediment. And the ebb tide typically just does not have that strength. And so the most rare of these situations is the symmetrical tide. And the most common is the flood dominant no ebb deposit. So what you get from situation A, which is the rare symmetrical tide situation, is these interbedded mud and sand deposits. But what happens typically is you'll have some sort of sedimentary structure in the sand because of the flow direction. And what happens when you have a bi-directional flow, so flood one direction, ebb the other direction, is you get herringbow cross stratification. And an example of this in the case of the symmetrical tide situation is shown here. We see that there is a bi-directional flow and the influence of the flow in both directions is about equal. Whereas our last and most common situation, situation C, where we have flood dominant no ebb deposits, we can see that the flow clearly has a dominant direction and the deposits show the dominant direction mostly if not completely throughout the section. Additionally, we can see these arrows pointing out stages in between each of the four set deposits where there's mud deposition or just thinner beds of rippled sands that indicate where the break in between flood deposits is, where you're going to have your ebb deposits or just slack water deposits of mud, and this kind of breaks up the unidirectional flood deposits and distinguishes tidal deposits like this one from other unidirectional sand-dominated deposits like Aeolian dunes, for example. And speaking of dunes, Aeolian environments are not the only environments where you can have dunes forming. As we can see on this slide, tides can cause dunes as well. In the figure on the bottom, it does say wind causing that dune, but the four sets that it's creating in its cross-sectional area, what we can see at the bottom of that animation, are forming the same structures that a tidal dune would form as well. So you can pretend that that says water, so we're all on the same page. And then more importantly, we'll look over here to the right figure. This right figure is showing tidal dunes, and we know that because what we see is that the dominant flood deposits are showing the four set deposition in the direction to the right of the slide. And then we have the mud drape shown here in figure B due to the slack water phase in between the flood and the ebb current. And then we have the ebb current, which goes to the left on the slide. And in figure C, where we're looking now at the ebb current deposits, we can see that the ebb current in this case was strong enough to not only deposit some sands over the mud drape and then a little bit on the backside of the flood dune here, but it was also strong enough to erode the front part of the flood current dune and this caused what's called a reactivation surface. Then lastly in figure D we can see that the slack water phase after the subordinate or ebb current occurred causes mud drape deposition on top of all the ebb current deposits. And lastly I want to point out that ebb current features are a distinguishing feature of bidirectional flow. I've already discussed this but it's important to remember that when we're trying to look at dune deposits in the field, you will immediately know that you're looking at bidirectional flow if you see any four sets going in the opposite direction of the dominant flood current direction. And this will be indicative of tidal environment. Here are some real life modern examples of dunes and compound dunes. Dunes, as we already discussed, have the normal sta side and lee side that we'll discuss more in the Aeolian video. And in between the dunes, there's fields of ripples. However, I also want to point out that there can be compound dunes in tidal dominated areas as well. For example, in the bottom right picture, we see that ripples can occur on top of the stoss side of the dunes if the dunes are large enough and if the tidal influence is large enough to form these compound dunes and those ripples on top of the dunes define compound dunes. Now, after having showed you a modern example, I felt it only necessary to show you an ancient example too. What we have here is an ancient example of tidal dunes. We can see all of the things we discussed. We see the paleo flow, ancient flow direction, going to the left of the screen in some areas, to the right in others. It looks like the left is the dominant direction, though, as we can see more four sets going in that direction. Additionally, we have mud drapes and ripples present at the bottom of the section, and so all
all of these features that we see in this section are very indicative of tidal environment. Now moving on to heterolithic assemblages. We already discussed how one way to distinguish four sets of sand caused by tidal deposits rather than something like aeolian deposits is to look for the presence of mud. And this presence of mud causes the assemblages that form due to tidal deposits to be called heterolithic assemblages. This is mainly found in tide-dominated environments like we already discussed, such as tidal flats, tide-dominated deltas, and tide-dominated estuaries. And shown here in the figure, we can see that there is a different name for the heterolithic bedding depending on how much mud versus sand is in the assemblage. And what we can see is flazer bedding in figure A, which has mostly sand and a little bit of mud, is indicative of a high energy tidal environment, whereas C, which seems like mostly mud and only a little bit of sand, is indicative of a low energy tidal environment and a high suspended sediment load. This suspended sediment load is important because like we said, the mud drapes occur when suspended particles or mud in the water settle down. And so this high suspended load is very important for mud deposition in tidal environments. However, these bedding types can also occur in other depositional settings, not just tidal flats, deltas, and estuaries. Glacial environments, fluvial environments, and deeper water environments can also cause heterolithic assemblages. So make sure you try and indicate other tidal characteristics in the outcrop before using heterolithic assemblages as your only evidence for a tidal environment. So now getting into some of the environments that can be tide dominated. These include sheltered tidal systems, such as tidal deltas, which typically happen in between barrier bars shown here in the figure, which is why they are called sheltered tidal systems. To show you a real life example of this, here's a picture on the bottom right. This is a tidal inlet on the coast of Massachusetts. We can see the flood delta and the ebb delta in this case, and the distinguishable ebb delta shape, this horseshoe type shape shown in both figures here, is common because of how flood and ebb currents work. So as we see in the figure to the left now, we can see that when you have these sheltering barrier bars, the ebb delta, which is going down the slide through the inlet, is going to flow in all directions down through the inlet and then only in the forward direction once it gets through, causing this horseshoe shaped bar, which is typical of ebb tidal deltas. Next, tidal estuaries. We can see in this figure that tide dominance causes a change in geometry of the estuaries. We can see on the very right, wave dominated estuaries. And then we see on the, in the middle, river dominated estuaries. And then we see on the very left, tide dominated estuaries. These include things like the fly estuary in Papua New Guinea. So if we look at this next figure, I have this picture here of the fly estuary in Papua New Guinea. This is where you have that typical elongated geometry of tidal dominated estuaries. And some features we can point out on this estuary include things like where this river channel gets very thick going toward offshore. And this is what's called the tidal limit. This tidal limit is where the tide reaches when it is at its peak high tide. And so this is the limit to which you'll see tidal deposition occurring. You'll only see it from this limit and then further toward the basin. Another couple of typical features that we see in tidal estuaries, such as the fly estuary, we can see that tidal channels and tidal point bars are indicative of tidal currents. What we mean by this is that these channels have point bars in their meanders that have these distinguishing features called flood bars and these flood barbs are caused because the flood currents disfigure the normal point bars in the channel. And this doesn't happen in normal point bars in rivers because they only have unidirectional flow, whereas tidal channels have bidirectional flow. Flow going toward the basin from the fluvial influence and from the ebb current, and then flow going away from the basin by the flood current. Next, we have open coast tidal flats. On this figure, we can see an increase in tidal tidal power or influence going to the left and an increase in wave influence going to the right. Tidal dominated estuaries, which we already discussed, include a floodplain with burrows and mudstones, a tidal flat with trough cross blazer and lenticular bedding, and tidal channels and point bars with an erosive base. And for the stratigraphy of tidal dominated deltas, they're typical of cross bedding, tidal bedding, reactive surface, and flazer wavy and lenticular bedding, herringbone cross
cross stratification, mud drapes, channel erosive bases, and coarsening upward facies. And for open coast tidal flats, you'll see all these features, however, disturbed intermittently by wave created features because open coast tidal flats are obviously not protected by barrier bars or anything. And so therefore they can't be protected from wave influence or storm influence. So to show this on a strat column, we can see, for example, in this case, a strat column typical of tidal flat environment where we have distinguishing features such as bidirectional flow structures like herringbone cross bedding shown, for example, here and a little bit up here. Additionally, we have evidence of mud draping going on in the sub and intertidal section. And so this mud draping is another indication of flood and ebb deposits and therefore tidal environment. And the last bit of evidence that we could use to indicate that this is a tidal environment is something such as rhythmic deposits, so spring and neap cycles. And so those are three distinguishing features that you should use when looking at a possible tidal environment in the rock record. Next, we have tidal dune stratigraphy. Tidal dune deposits, like we already talked about, include evidence for ebb currents and bidirectional flow, and mostly four sets in the flood current direction. And then also evidence for mud draping on the lower leaf face of the dune as well as the bottom sets. And ripples are typically common in the bottom sets as well. Lastly, for stratigraphy, we talked about tidal channels and tidal bars, but we didn't discuss what kind of strat column that they would form. But since we've already talked about fluvial processes, you should know generally how point bar deposits or point bar strat columns should look for fluvial point bars. So in the case of the tidal point bars, we should expect similar point bar strat column, however, with bidirectional flow indicators that indicate both the flood current direction as well as the fluvial and ebb flow direction. And the last thing we'll discuss is ichnophases. We talk about trace fossils present in every single environment video, and the trace fossils that you'll find in tidal environments include things such as syringiomorpha, arenicolites, diplocraterion, and scolithos. Other than scolithos, I'm not exactly sure if I'm pronouncing the rest right, but you get the point. And so within the tidal sequence, you'll find all of these types of ichnofauna in the areas indicated to the right. In the subtitle area, you'll find scolithos, arenicolites, and diplocraterion. And then in the intertidal sand flat area, you'll find all four. And in the mixed intertidal area, you'll find syringiomorpha, scolithos, and then a bunch of other ichnofauna that are less common but can also occur. With that, thank you so much for watching. I hope this video was helpful and helped you learn about tidal dominated environments and how the processes and deposition in those environments can affect the rocks that get preserved in those environments. And I hope you come back to enjoy the rest of the depositional environment videos. And like always, if I miss anything or you'd like to request another topic for me to go over, please let me know and I'd be happy to do so. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.